welcome back to Pia Talks. We are back for more paranormal. We are talking believers. Season one, episode six. We are following Carla Jones. She lives in Bloomington, Illinois, and this takes place in June of 2011. Carla is a single mom, so she is everything for her daughter. She's a good cop, she's a bad cop, she's the playmate, she's the protector, you know, single moms, they do it all, right? Carla had just moved into a new place and she said that later that night, she noticed that the lights started flickering and she thought it was really crazy, but the lights went right back to normal. She thinks it's a little odd that they would flicker and then go back to normal. She said over the next few days, she was still having that same issue. The lights would flicker, they would go back to normal, but they also started turning off and then coming back on for no reason. She thought maybe it's faulty wiring. So she calls her landlord and she asks her landlord to stop by to check the electrical. He comes by, checks everything out and lets her know there's absolutely nothing wrong with the electrical in her place. Carla says after a while, she realized that the flickering of the lights and the lights going on and off was in sort of a pattern. She says the lights flickering on and off seemed to only happen when her daughter was in the room. Whenever her daughter was around, that's when it happened. That by itself would freak me out. If that's the pattern, she said the weird stuff didn't stop there. That on June 16th, 2011, she said that afternoon she was cooking dinner when her daughter called for her. She tells her to hold on for a minute. She's in the middle of cooking. And when she went to see what her daughter needed, she said that when she came back to the kitchen, the entire kitchen was destroyed. She said that she became extremely scared, but at the same time, she was wondering, did somebody really come into my house and tear up my kitchen? Which is something that I would be nervous about too, you know? The first thing that comes to your mind isn't that some entity is in your house tearing a place up. So the flickering lights, the kitchen being destroyed, you know, you know my people. I'm usually ready to go, but not yet on this one. On this one, I'm not quite ready to go yet. Cause I'm thinking somebody could have came in here and tore this place up, but why? You know what I mean? She's new to the area. I don't know. I'd hang in there just a little bit. She says that even though she was scared, she didn't want to get too worked up. She wasn't really sure. However, she said later that night, she was reading a book to her daughter, Emma. In the middle of reading this book to Emma, Emma tells her that she has a new friend who lives in her closet. <laughs> really, Emma? because mama only pays rent for the two of us. Who the hell is in the closet? Okay, me personally, I would do my best not to get too worked up. I would just grab a knife or a baseball bat and go upstairs to examine Emma's closet, okay? Cause you know, I watch a lot of crime TV and I've heard about people hiding out in the closet. I'm just saying, you won't be doing that here. Okay, me and Emma live here. I mean, gosh, she says that she gets a little freaked out, but she thinks maybe this is Emma's imaginary friend. See, I lucked out. My son did not have any imaginary friends. Uh, I'm thankful. But you can't see him. He's more like a shadow than a person. Don't worry, I'm not scared of him. No, Emma, say it as it's so. No, ma'am, not the shadow person. It is at this point where it's time to put up the book and call the landlord. I am going to need my last month's rent and security deposit back because I'm thinking that you know about the person in the closet upstairs. Uh-uh. Me, Emma, shadow people, uh-uh, sir. We are out. Emma's a sweetheart and she is really brave. She was not afraid but uh, her mother was, and so would I. Three days later, Carla says that her and Emma went across the street to visit their neighbors, Pat and Laura. She says that when she got there, she told Pat and Laura every detail of what's been happening in her house. The lights, the kitchen, the closet 
shadow person, everything. And she said she was completely surprised that Pat and Laura never said a word, didn't look at her crazy, didn't seem to think she was nuts, nothing. Now, I found that odd because I thought surely they would say, is this a joke? But she said they didn't. She says that at the end of the visit, they told her they could tell that she seemed uneasy and they offered to walk her across the street to her house to make sure she got in safely. Okay. Oh my God. Mm -mm. Um, it is at that time. I'm gonna see if I can stay at Pat and Laura's for the evening or a hotel or the car. Uh-uh. Pat and Laura search her entire house to make sure that she's safe, to make sure there's nobody there. They show no signs of break-in. And after they've searched the property top to bottom, they leave. So her and Emma are there alone. Carla says she no longer feels safe in her house. And I, I, yeah, I get it. I get it. Carla says she wasn't sure how much longer she could hide her fear from her daughter. And... I don't know if I would have been able to hide my fear at all. I know I would try. I would try very hard, but it's starting to be too much. On June 20th, 2011, Carla says she has had enough. She calls a security firm and she gets all the bells and whistles in her house. I appreciate that. To the regular person, a security system is great. For the regular Joe Smo, but your security system isn't going to do much for the shadow guy in the closet. I'm just saying. She's still at this point believing that somebody is coming in and out of her house. So she says with all these cameras and the bells and whistles, she is bound to catch whoever it is that is playing these pranks on her. Whoever tore up that kitchen, she is going to figure it out with these cameras and the alarm system. She says less than a week after she puts in the new camera, she hears her daughter scream. She says she could tell her daughter was extremely terrified. She says that when she gets up to Emma's room, Emma tells her a man's voice was coming out of her closet and that the voice said, I can kill you. Carla said she did her best to keep calm There's no keeping calm. I mean, seriously, you've got to go. I mean, if you don't want to run out of there screaming and hollering like I would, that's okay. Uh, just walk out fast and quiet, but you got to go. She said that she tried to convince her daughter and herself that it was just a nightmare. And she was able to convince her daughter, you know, to go back to sleep. Once she got Emma back to sleep, she said that she went to review the footage from the security system cameras that she had put in the rooms in the house. And she said she didn't have a clue what she expected to see, but it wasn't what she thought. I saw a dark shadow hovering over her head. I heard it. I'm concerned it was then that you ran back to your daughter's room grabbed your baby up and left I'm talking no shoes or anything just keys and a purse let's go no she says that she had no idea what to do and she didn't believe that anybody would believe her she says so what she decides to do is she calls Laura across the street who is a paranormal investigator and this is when I got ticked off okay so earlier she told us that her and Emma went over to Laura and Pat's, told them about all the activity that's going on in her house, and they didn't find anything weird about it. But my thing is, they didn't offer to investigate either. I mean, if I'm over at your house and you're a paranormal investigator and I'm telling you about all this crazy crap that's going on at my house, you would think that Laura would have said, hey girl, let me bring all this EVP equipment and everything over here and scan your house. Let me set up some of these red light vision cameras or whatever that stuff is called and set this up here. Let's figure out what's going on. She could have said anything besides a seance because we don't do the seance. But you know what I mean? Help a sister out. 
Anyway, Carla says she calls Laura and Laura says, okay, I'll come over. Maybe that was it. Maybe Laura needed an engraved invitation to come on over here to this house. Girl, we are in danger. Anyway, Laura comes right over and she brings her EVP equipment. Laura tells her once she has set up all this equipment that she needs to be completely quiet so that they do not muddy up this recording. They need to find out what's going on. She's in there asking questions to the person in the closet, I guess. And without a doubt, you can see that there is a man's face in the shadow. Hell no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Um, can we, can we get a copy of this so I can send it to the landlord with my letter that I am terminating this lease and we're moving out and I want my money? And if you don't give me my last month's rent and security deposit, I'm going to take you to Judge Judy. You knew something was wrong with this place. I'm telling you what, honey. I would have said, listen. I'm going to pack my car up. See if Pat can pull y'all's car out the garage. What can you get in y'all's car? Because I'm never coming back here after this evening. Everything else is, it lives here now. With the thing in the closet. Then Laura tells her her theory. She says that she believes the spirit belongs to a murderer from the 70s who had murdered children in the woods by the house. According to news footage, the killer mysteriously died before he could be convicted of his crimes and his name was Barnes. She says after they caught the video and the voice, things really calmed down and they never heard or saw any more shadows or voices in her house. She believes by confronting this ghost or spirit it led them to leave the house. Um, they continue to live there. I tell you what, I never would have trusted that. I would never have trusted any of that. We would have moved, period. Our next story covers a lady named Emma Billings. Emma lives in Haven, Connecticut, and this takes place in October 2007. Emma is a lover of architecture. She really loves old turn of the century architecture. She loves old movies. She just loves the classics. She in 2007 takes up a new job as the manager of the Camden pub. She's super excited about this job. This pub is in a building that is 200 years old. cannot work here. I know. I know what you're thinking. What could you do, Pia? I could find a job somewhere else. I'm sorry. I cannot live anywhere where the per I know. And I cannot work there either. Oh my God. I am so limited. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm gonna need to see somebody. I am seriously afraid of everything. Absolutely not. Squirrels, chipmunks, I don't care, hamsters, no, I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't. She said that the Camden, or the locals call it the Cammy. she said that the owners rarely come in there. I wonder why. So she said it was her job to keep the business running smoothly and to make sure that all the customers were happy. In November of 2007, she had been working there for a few months and the owner told her that he would like to do some renovations on the building. He wanted to start renting out space above the bar to kind of make it a pub slash hotel restaurant type of situation. And it was going to be her job to help him figure out what all needed to be updated, repaired, renovated. She was also supposed to be in charge of cleaning of the spaces that are going to be renovated. So she decides that she's gonna go upstairs into the old spaces to start jotting down, getting, you know, getting her list and getting prepared for the remodel. I'm telling you, 
way too many paranormal shows where they start renovating and tearing everything down. Then the next thing you know, they done opened up Pandora's box. Just leave it like it is. Let it all be settled. You wanna do something, spray some holy water up there. I'm just saying. She gets up the stairs and she says she gets to the door, but before she can open the door, she hears like young girls giggling. And she thought, how the heck would anybody be up here? But then she says when she opens up the door, there's nothing there. When she opens up the door, she said the room is just filled with a whole bunch of old stuff. Just a bunch of junk, just random junk all over the place. However, buried under all the junk, she finds an old antique box. As soon as she says she found that old box, I said, girl, don't you open that box. Mm -mm. I don't know. She clearly didn't watch any paranormal videos because, ma'am, don't touch any of that stuff. She opens the box and she says inside she could see that it was some century-old assortment of ladies' items. She said that there was a broken glass in there, a broken picture frame, a photo inside, some brushes, and she said the photo inside was of a beautiful little girl. And on the back of the photo, it said Little Cammy. And she thought, wow, this bar, this pub must be named after this little girl. So she takes the photo downstairs to the bar and she hangs it up. Now look, the little girl in the picture, beautiful. But no ma'am, mm -mm. I wouldn't have opened that box. She says the next day before they open, she heads back upstairs to continue her work and she hears somebody coming up behind her on the steps. Then she turns around and there's nobody there. So she continues to go up the steps and she says it happens again. She feels somebody coming up the steps behind her, but when she turns around, there's nothing. So she says that not only does she feel somebody coming up behind her, but that she hears wheezing and the pitter patter of steps. So this freaks her out a little bit and she decides to turn around and go back down the steps. When she goes back down the steps, she says that she sees wet, tiny footprints from down the steps throughout the bar and up to the actual bar and they stop as if the footprints walked through the bar, I guess as if the person whose footprints those belonged to had walked through the bar. And then stopped. If there was a person, where did they go? I would have walked out the bar, left my keys right there on the bar because I quit. The producers asked her, does she think she was imagining that? And she said, no, I heard what I heard, and I saw what I saw. She says that she went to check the security footage, and she saw nobody on the security footage. However, she did see those wet footprints. Two days later, a customer comes up to her and asks her, what is going on in this place? What is going on in your bathroom? She said that one of her friends had just been attacked in the bathroom. And she says, I took a picture. This thing was trying to grab her friend. Honey, Emma said she had no idea. She thought maybe it was a little glare, uh, some kind of camera trick. She said maybe it was a lighting situation. And one of her coworkers said, maybe the Cammy has a ghost. Then he points to the picture and says, maybe it's this little girl. Yikes. Fellas, stop playing around. That would freak me out again. Here's my keys, I quit, okay? At the same time as they're talking about this, one of their customers almost trips and he says somebody pushed him. However, when he turns around, there's nobody there. Nobody saw anybody push him. So she goes to view the video tape and she can't believe what she saw. It looked like something approached the man from behind. She said that she was scared, but she didn't want the word to spread across New Haven that the cami was haunted. So the next day, she says she's at the bar and this older gentleman comes in 
and she asked him if she could help him. And he said, no, I think maybe I can help you. And he tells her that his great grandfather used to own the Cami over a century ago. Great grandfather had 14 kids and one of his daughters came down with something and died at five years old. And he says that that photo you have hanging up here in the bar, that little girl looks about five years old, doesn't she? He says she was probably sick already when that picture was taken. And he said that her name was Alma Margaret Perkins, but everybody called her little Cammy. Oh God, he's right. That's what's on the back of the picture. He says that she died right there in the pub upstairs in the nursery. Oh boy. Then the man says, well, I've taken up enough of your time. See you later. What? You don't come in here dropping bobs like this and leave. Emma let him leave. I mean, you can't hold the man hostage. She says that she was completely freaking out, but she grabbed her keys and she goes back upstairs. Honey, please. I want to grab my keys and left to my car. I'm not going back up there. She goes back up there. When she's going back up the steps, she sees footprints leading back up the stairs. So she believes that little Cammy has beat her to the steps and she's now going upstairs. She says that she gets upstairs and she finds the nursery where Cammy died. And she says that she could actually feel Cammy's presence and she could hear her labored breathing. And she says that she has never been so scared in her life. Then she said she heard Cammy speak. <laughs> Little Cammy wanted her mom. She had disturbed Cammy's spirit when she opened up that box and took that picture out the box and took it downstairs and hung it up in the bar. She believes that the only reason why Cammie is roaming the building and playing jokes on people and touching people is because she's actually looking for her mama. So she runs back downstairs into the bar. She grabs the photo. She puts the photo back in the box with all of the things that were in there. She believes that those items belong to Cammie's mom. And once she put everything back in the box, she said that they finished the remodel, they did not touch the nursery room. They left everything exactly like it was and there has been no more appearances from Cami or any other entity. Wow. And she is still the manager of the, the Candon Bar and Hotel. Um, yeah, buddy. See, had she listened to me and not even opened that box, she wouldn't have known about Cami at all. I'm just saying, don't touch stuff. Our next story follows Brian Watson, who is a Freemason, and he's very big on craftsmanship and tradition. This happens in Missoula, Montana in March of 2015. He and his wife bought a new house, and he was excited because the house that he bought was owned previously four different times and each time it was by a Freemason. So he was going to be the fifth Freemason to actually purchase this house. And he said this house was special because it was built in 1911 by Freemason Dr. Jacob Sanders. He says that him and his wife, Evelyn, and their daughter, Haley, were super excited and they moved into the house. So it seems that the doctor actually hid jewelry in different places in the house for each person to find as sort of a hide and seek treasure hunting kind of thing. So on the first day that they moved into the house, him and his family actually decided to look for these pieces of jewelry. As they go through the house, they find several little pieces of jewelry and they thought it was absolutely cool. And they took pictures and all these pieces of jewelry that they found were actually cemented or glued into certain structures so they would never fall out. One month later, he says that his daughter starts screaming in the middle of the night and she's screaming so loud, sound was absolutely petrifying, he said. 
She told him that she saw a ghostly sick girl kneeling at her bedside and he said he didn't know what to say. He said he just tried to convince her that it was just her imagination and she was having a bad dream. However, he said he wasn't sure what to believe. He didn't know what was happening. Then he said he realized his daughter was clutching a locket that looked just like the one she had found earlier that was embedded in the fireplace, one of those pieces of jewelry that the doctor had hidden. So he goes downstairs to check the fireplace to see if the locket is still there, and it wasn't. That was the actual locket that was in the fireplace. Somehow it ended up in his daughter's hand. He opens up the locket and inside the locket is an old photo. On the back of it, it said, Dr. J. Sanders. That's the man who built the house. He has no idea how that <laughs> locket that was wedged in the fireplace ends up upstairs. So he says that just starts the first of a long string of mysteries that happened in that house. He says the next day his wife is in the basement doing laundry and while she's doing laundry she finds a ring in the dryer. Then all of a sudden the lights start to flicker and she starts screaming. She tells him that there's something there in the basement. Something touched her hair. So he's looking around, he's trying to check to find out what's going on and then she gives him the ring. And he looks at her and he's like, wait a second, I recognize this ring. He realizes that is another ring that was also embedded in the fireplace. And he's like, what, a, wait, let me go up to the fireplace. So he goes to the fireplace to check and there it is, the ring is not there. So he puts the ring back with some heavy epoxy. So he's like, this thing is not falling off. It's not getting downstairs in the dryer. Like he has no idea what the heck is going on, but he's like, listen, let me super, super glue this thing back to this fireplace. And while he's doing that, he realized there's a pocket watch that's also stuck in the fireplace. So he adds some extra epoxy to that too, saying, uh-uh, we're not playing with you, you know, pocket watch. That same evening, his daughter and his wife, they go out to a movie. So he's thinking, oh, wow, I've got the place to myself. He decides he's gonna do a little research on the house. And he comes across some old reports detailing the death of Dr. Sanders and his daughter. It said that the doctor died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in the basement and that his daughter, Josephine, passed away shortly after that, she had become ill and they suspected it was due to the heartache of losing her father. He says as he's reading this article, he starts noticing some noise and that the noise just keeps getting louder and louder. And he says it sounds like the ticking of a watch. So he decides to record it. And then I saw this uh, shadow. So he goes and follows it. Hoodna, you don't do that. Oh man. He says that when he gets downstairs in the basement, he sees a small light that was floating near the ceiling. And he says he can't really describe it, but it just felt like a, a ball of energy. And it was just leading him to one spot in the ceiling. He says he reached up to touch the hole in the ceiling and he believes it was a bullet hole because of the black residue around it. He says it must have been gunpowder. So he suddenly knew this is where Dr. Sanders died. He says he believes that the spirit of Dr. Sanders led him downstairs in the basement because he wanted him to know that his death was actually an accident and that his daughter meant them no harm. He thinks that their spirits are just lingering there in the house. He says he thinks that their spirits are just stuck there. However, he said him and his family moved out right away. He says they have purchased a house a few miles away and unfortunately he is stuck with both houses and Mr. Sanders and his daughter. Mm -mm. Oh God. I am really glad that he moved Save your family. Move out of there. It's weird. 
I think that those other Freemasons who told him he should buy that house knew exactly what was going on. They knew that Dr. Sanders and Josephine still lived there. That was wrong. That was wrong. I tell you what, I would cut off contact with those people. Like, listen, what you did to me. And now we have two houses because of this. That's just way too much. Anyway, it was very interesting though. And until next time, bye. <laughs>